Hi, everybody. Hi, I'm Chris Leatham, and this is uh, another episode of The Economy and You. And today we're going to be talking with a guest who's a correspondent. Uh, he's been spending some time in Turkey. And we're going to talk about some of the issues that are going on in that part of the world because it's, you know, I think the impact of, of what's going on um, in Istanbul, in Turkey, uh, and their neighbors, um, what's going on with Syria and so on, I think it deserves commentary and, and some discussion. And I think today we've got the perfect guest. Today's guest is Russell Kohler. Russell uh, is visiting uh, with us today through Skype, through, through technology. Of course, that's what we do so well here at Think Tech Hawaii. And so I want to welcome uh, Russell to the show. Thanks, Chris. It's great to be here. Nice to have you, Russell. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, anyway, you, uh, you lived in Turkey for a while. I and, did. Yes, and now you're currently, where are you currently? Where are you today? Currently, I'm living in Washington, D.C. Uh, I moved there from Istanbul, Turkey, uh, having worked there this past summer. And I've lived there for about a year, year and a half, mm -hmm. about two years ago. So I spent a couple of years in the, in the immediate region. And uh, it's, a, it's a great place, very interesting, very exciting. But um, yeah. I'm well, glad, glad to be back. Well, Turkey certainly is an area where east meets west. It's, it's positioned just west of the Caspian Sea and uh, provides the only real outlet to, uh, to the, uh, um, what do they call that, the, uh, the, uh, that sea there, the, uh, where oh, Russia the connects? Sea. The Black Sea, yeah, okay, there it is, yeah. the Black Sea. I don't know why I have a hard time remembering the Black Sea. <laughs> um, but anyway, it's, it is a land of contrast. Um, over there, right? I mean, you've got, uh, you've got uh, a country that's uh, supposed to be pr uh, practicing uh, democracy, uh, but mm -hmm. we have a president um, who currently now in, uh, in Turkey has, uh, he's been playing, uh, playing a new, new game. And um, we saw a recent coup. Uh, and uh, so I'd like to get some of your feedback on what do you think, Ernan, where do you think he goes from here um, now? Absolutely. I mean, you're absolutely right to point out that Turkey is, is a country of different contrasts. It's a country with a very tumultuous history and is really a country that you know, it, it, it lends itself to being really the epitome of, of pluralism. There are uh, dozens, if not a uh, hundred different cultures, mm -hmm. religious sects within Turkey, and you know, the, the, the governments of the past had reflected that based upon uh, practicing uh, policies of intense secularism so as to not create uh, or intensify uh, sectarianism in, within the country. Now, unfortunately, uh, this, the current government has been um, utilizing and, and propagating conservative policies, consolidating um, its, its political power within the country, and really uh, uh, legitimizing its actions through this um, more Islamic ideology. I well, there, there is, it. yeah, there is that sort of Islamic ideology um, <laughs> that has been a part of uh, Turkey's, um, you know, culture for a very long mm -hmm. time. Um, and uh, now that we see uh, Erdogan uh, and his policies and, and the impact of his policies, of course, is the pushback that we had with the, the coup d'etat or the attempted coup, coup d'etat. We've seen uh, thousands of people being arrested. Uh, and I think we're seeing a further uh, dissolution of what we would call part of a secular democratic structure, structure, whereas you have an independent court system, you have a free and functioning legislature, uh, you have a military that answers to, uh, the, the, you know, to the government, but most importantly, to a citizen government. So the mm -hmm. question is, is that, um, was this coup, did this, does this help him more than, um, than hurt him? From where you look at it today, is, is this something now that uh, is going to make it harder for him to dis, or easier for him to dismantle um, the, uh, the democratic structures? That's that's a great question. I mean, for a long time, uh, since 2003, when uh, or 2002 rather, when the AKP, the uh, Justice and Development Party within Turkey, Erdogan's party, came into power, and in 2003 when he became mm -hmm. prime minister. Uh, there was a real struggle for you know, this new conservative party to overtake and eventually dissolve the military's political power within the country. Uh, and over time, you know, uh, along with some mock, uh, really pretty uh, 
ridiculous trials based upon fraudulent evidence and, uh, and, um, and really uh, to destroy the power of the military in the country, they've been able to do that. And this now, uh, this new coup d'etat, which is one of four that have happened throughout Turkey's history. So this is a country that's not, uh, it's, it's, you know, it, it's, it's not a regular uh, uh, development, but it, it's certainly, um, you know, it, it's not absent of, of, this, of this happening. Um, but this coup, it's what seems to have happened is this has given him sort of the final, uh, uh, I guess. Sort of uh, final justification. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. The final justification has allowed him justification to really take the gloves off and go after his political enemies once again, wherever they may be, whoever they may be. Now, is this Whether necessary? Is this, is this necessary because of what's going on um, in the surrounding area? I mean, is, there, is it an imperative that he needs to take, uh, sort of take on a totalitarian, totalitarianistic bent in order to, uh, to protect Turkey from what's going on with ISIS um, and some of the concerns or considerations with the sort of the recent empowerment of, of the Kurds, um, because we've seen um, the K Kurds, who were previously part of the P PKK and considered a terrorist organi organization, they're now taking and pushing back against ISIS, uh, I think, quite effectively. Uh, and as you were saying when we talked earlier, that they have uh, sort of uh, solidified their position east of the Euphrates. Um, is it important, or does Erdogan see this as a, a, a part of, or a rationale for, for taking and putting himself into a more, a, a dictator-type role? You know, I think given what's, what's happening in the region, and more so than not what's happening within Turkey itself, um, this has given him especially the justification for a little, for this further political consolidation. Now, this has happened in the past. Uh, in 2013, we had the massive uh, pro, uh, Gezi Park protests, yeah. um, which, which really were the first time the Turkish population had risen up against uh, Erdogan, uh, President Erdogan's policy at that time, Prime Minister Erdogan. Um, and then, of course, you had, in December 2013, you had the corruption scandal uh, protest, which Really, that was the final straw between Fethullah Gulen, which who is the leader, was apparently the uh, the leader of the coup d'état, according to the Turkish government. Right. Um, and you know, this has been sort of an ebb and flow over time with 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 uh, President Erdogan. He well, has, Erdogan is blaming this uh, this Muslim cleric that's been living in the United States. Now, um, is this guy just a uh, this clerk, is he just um, sort of the, uh, the goat? Uh, and uh, again, a further justification of Erdogan's ac actions, or is, is this guy really, is he really take, does he really have an interest? Is there any, has there been any proof that he is in fact um, driving a, a different agenda to get rid of Erdogan? Well, there's definitely a, a tense relationship between the two. You know, they, they were former allies, political allies, oh. um, former ideological allies, during the time of the AKP's rise, during the time of, of you know, the Taif Erdogan's uh, political rise, but you know, eventually, when it when it did fall apart, the two did become very bitter and used any and all means to diminish each other's power within the country. Sounds like now, an ugly divorce. I exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. And, yeah. But going, you know, yeah. whether or not the Tulubulen was actually a, a, you know, a, a part or a, a, a main plotter within this, this coup d'etat is you know, analytically hard to believe. Um, mm -hmm. It's uh, when we consider, you know, looking at autocracies and authoritarian governments, you know, whenever there is the need for a distraction, especially in terms of times of crisis, the first thing you do is you externalize the threat. Yeah. Um, and more or less what ended up happening was a very disgruntled um, group within the military had actually um, organized itself and planned this coup 
within the actual institution itself, not necessarily have any foreign backing. And it's actually come out that mm -hmm. these military officials, including actually the, uh, the commander of Injurik Base, which is the air base we use to um, strike right. uh, in right. Syria and strike in Iraq, uh, they'd actually used WhatsApp uh, to, to plan this, this entire operation. And the reason for that is the end-to-end -end encryption. Um, and so to think that you would have now a, an outside actor from the United States communicating, that's, that's a lot of technicalities that would be hard to believe in an operation which really seemed to be insular um, and seemed to be military driven. Right, right. Well, but it, is it plausible that he may have had some role to, to play in this, even if it was just, you know, one, a role of simply, um, say, you know, uh, cheerleading, uh, cheerleading these, uh, the military's attempt uh, to take power? Because the military has had power for quite a long time. They've always had a very, fairly political military, and, uh, and they have been sort of maybe... Maybe they were given too much authority. Perhaps uh, he was concerned about them having too much clout. Uh, Absolutely. I mean, ever, ever since the, the, the founding of the Turkish Republic mm -hmm. and the death of Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, the, you know, the, the, the father of Turks, the first president of Turkey, uh, he had really given the role to the protection of the Turkish constitution, not to the political leaders, but to the Turkish, the, the institution of the military mm -hmm. in Turkey. Right. And so they had taken that role um, up and had really executed that role quite a few times now in the, in the, past, in the last six, seven decades. So do you think we've seen, the last, uh, last op we've seen the last attempt at a coup by the military? You know, that's an that's a interesting question because I'll... I'll from talking to, from hearing, talking to, studying all the experts on Turkey, uh, not a single person would have would have predicted this could have happened. Mm -hmm. um, this was probably the, the biggest surprise of any real global development that that could have been, um, because this was a this was a country seemingly prosperous from the outside that had gotten control over its institutions, its government had already started to purge people um, over the last five or six years or so, mm -hmm. and you would have expected that, uh, well, this sort of level of planning, you know, given the, given the political consolidation, would not have been possible. But wow. Wow. That's, that's quite amazing. Through, yeah. Well, you know, when we come back, I want to talk a little bit about some of the current things that are happening. Today, there was an announcement uh, by Russia that they had taken out Abu Muhammad al-Adnani, which we are saying, uh, no, that they weren't responsible for that, but we think that we were. Mm -hmm. So we're going to take a commercial break, and we'll be right back, and let's talk about some of the current, uh, other current events going on in the region. Okay, this is Hawaii, the state of clean energy, a wonderful show we do, uh, 4 to 4.30 every single Wednesday. And the progenitors of this show, uh, Sharon Moriwaki and Ray Starling to my left. So how's it going? How's it going, Sharon? Do you like the show? I love the show. Yeah. And I hope everybody watches the show and joins in and gives us their comments on clean energy. Yeah. Every week. Every week with incredible yeah. guests and topics and discussion and mostly candor. This, we like this candor. month is all renewable energy and next month we're going to look at procurement. Each month we have a different series yeah. uh, and so it's, it's going very well. We learn well. so much. We keep the oh, public so, so well advised the best we can. Ray, what do you think? Well, I think this is the place where it's happening. This is where we discuss the latest of what, what is going on in the energy world. And, it's a great place to be, a great place to meet some new people that are into the energy world that uh, we, uh, we haven't talked to before. So I'm happy to be here. Okay, this is a, you know, energy is the biggest thing happening in Hawaii, whether you realize it or not, it's going to affect all of our lives, is affecting all of our lives. And it's like a million things are happening in energy. How could you possibly understand what's happening unless you are informed? This is your way. This is the deal. Hawaii, the state of clean energy, every Wednesday, 4 o'clock, right? Join us. Yeah, I knew you'd say that. <laughs>
And hey, hi, I'm Chris Leatham, and we're back here with The Economy and You at Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, today's guest, um, we've been talking to Russell Kohler. Russell is in Washington, D.C., so this is sort of one of those sort of uh, weird and wonderful shows that we do with Think Tech, where we actually have a, an interview with somebody over Skype. Um, Skype still has its challenges, but we, I, I think it's always interesting when we have a, an opportunity to engage people outside of Hawaii. Um, and Russell, thank you for being on the show today. We're, you know, one of the things we're talking about is, 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 uh, is some of the current activities that are going on and Turkey's role. You know, Turkey um, is probably no lover of uh, Assad, Syrian's President Assad. Um, and we're seeing lots of activity going on. Of course, ISIS has made a move into that region. Um, in their attempt to create a, uh, a, a caliphate, is it caliphate? I think the word is caliphate, yeah. to yeah, create a absolutely. caliphate. And, uh, and there's been a lot of pushback, and we've got a lot of different players in the, in the field today. Uh, right there on Turkey's border, we've got, um, you've got FSA, we've got the Kurds, we've got the Russians, of course, who, um, who are supporting al-Assad. Um, we've got the Iranians, apparently the Iranians are, are in the middle of this battlefield as well, uh, over Turkey, and uh, are over um, Syria. And so, uh, how is this impacting? Uh, how is this impacting uh, uh, Turkey and uh, Turkey in terms of their economics, in terms of what they're doing politically? Um, what is the fallout from all of this? Absolutely, that's a great question. And you know, Turkey, you know, other than Syria, mm -hmm. uh, which um, you know, of course, is has been the greatest victim, and the Syrian people have been the greatest victim of this horrific civil war. Oh, sure. Turkey, Turkey has, has probably been uh, the second greatest victim in, within all this. Uh, and the reason for that is with the, um, the intensification of the, uh, of the war, of the involvement of outside actors, and the inclusion, of course, of, of more advanced weaponry, more and more people are being pushed out. Syria and leaving and, run, and running and fleeing Syria. And more and more of those people, if not, uh, I believe Turkey now has almost 3 million refugees within its borders. And so, you know, over the last four years, for a long period of time, Turkey had actually been um, paying and financing the, uh, the housing and really the asylum of those refugees um, itself and really been fit, fit, uh, fitting the bill. But there was a sort of, bill. Turkey was a bit of a conduit though for those people uh -huh. who wanted to go fight either against or for ISIS. Their, their border was rather fluid for quite some time. And I think it's only recently that they've started to tighten up their border uh, to mitigate uh, the opportunity for people to come in and out of, uh, out, mm -hmm. out of uh, the southern border. Exactly, and you know, I was, you know, a couple months ago, I was at a, a, at a briefing regarding the Syrian refugee situation. There was a, a former uh, Turkish national uh, police official uh, who had actually been uh, the uh, director of their border security, uh, their national border security. Mm. And he had actually uh, stated that, you know, it, it's difficult to close down a border at this time the United States was Tell, ask, you know, requesting Turkey, you need to shore up your, your border security. And he, he said, you know, to the audience that, you know, it's difficult to shore up your border security when it's a government policy not to do so. Yeah. Um, and, and it had been that way for a couple of years, which was Turkey was allowing these, these fighters and these volunteers to move through its territory in order to bolster the numbers and the ranks of Syrian rebel forces. Uh, of course, many of those, as we now know, ended up fighting for ISIS. Many of those ended up fighting for al-Nusra. Um, for Turkey, you know, they've not been supportive of ISIS or al-Nusra in any, any way or any fashion, in any financing or, or security or, or any, any of those aspects thereof. But, um, they are very supportive of specific Turkmen groups within Syria and wanted the border to be open so that way a, a very easy flow of supplies could go back and forth. Well, that's interesting because, you know, you get a, a collateral consequence of having, allowing supplies to go through is that you allow people to go through as well. Uh, and I would, it would seem to me that this has exacerbated the situation on some level because if supplies are going through, that could also mean that military arms are passing through 
Absol absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, historically, the Turkish-Syrian border, you know, is a, is a place for smugglers. Mm -hmm. uh, the Turkish-Syrian border has always been a place whereby the PKK had uh, moved its fighters back and forth across the border, the PYD, which is the Syrian northern, right. um, the northern Syrian Kurds, they moved back and forth across the border. And so, historically, this border is extremely difficult to manage, extremely difficult to secure, nonetheless. And so, securing it in, in any way or in any fashion is, is a monumental task. Um, unfortunately, uh, it seems like over the past couple of years there have been no political will to do so because it really was the agenda um, in order to support these specific groups. So now we know that um, uh, Russia's president, Putin, has been, uh, uh, has been sort of snuggling up to uh, Erdogan uh, lately. Um, what do you think uh, is the motivation behind this? And I think people would like to know, I mean, this is sort of the dynamic that's going on in that region is that uh, we're now seeing Turkey, which has been a NATO, a member of NATO for quite some time, now sort of cozying up to Russia. And uh, I guess the thing that if I would, were somebody who wanted to understand these issues is, is why would they want to have a tighten or, or a, an improved relationship with Russia at this point? You're right, and it's a very complicated situation. It's one of those instances where two states compartmentalize their, you know, their, um, their problems and their, um, you know, their periods of cooperation. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, as you know, we briefly mentioned, you know, we, while we cooperate or wish to cooperate with Russia on, you know, w within Syria, um, we don't cooperate with them within Ukraine. And so it's one of those, it's one of those issues specifically for Turkey for a long period of time that they had been able to manage their uh, disagreements with Russia uh, regarding Bashar al-Assad in mm -hmm. Syria, but also have a burgeoning uh, trade and economic relationship um, between each other, um, between their two countries. Unfortunately, the, the turn from all that was, uh, in no, this past November, uh, the downing of the Russian fighter jet um, in Turkish airspace. Mm -hmm. um, that's what really broke the relationship for a long period of time um, between two countries that really were looking to align their interests economically and regionally. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, um, it seems exactly, it, it seems as though they've, as you, as you said, they've started to restart this new relationship. And the reason for that um, for both parties is you know, both are hurting financially, both are hurting economically, both are hurting politically. Uh, even though Putin has uh, very much politically consolidated his country, mm -hmm. he still is a man that has personalized politics. Yeah. And he always needs to seem strong. He needs political wins. And it's the same for Recep Tayyip Erdogan in Turkey. But, and so, but they're also, Russia still has an issue too. If they want to be able to move goods in and out of, uh, uh, in and out of the Black Sea, they have to go through Istanbul. Uh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So and it's really important. It's an imperative for them to maintain a, a working relationship with, with the Turks. Exactly. And, you know, as, as, again, as we spoke earlier, the um, Rusatom, the Russian Atomic Agency, is actually helping build and construct a nuclear power plant, uh, the Akuyu plant, in southern Turkey, which it will provide a base power supply for pretty much all of southern Turkey. And mm -hmm. on, of course, very low rates because it's a state-owned industry. Um, there, uh, along with that, we have the new South Stream uh, pipeline, yes. which is, has been installed, but will most likely be restarted, which will be a, a Russian natural gas pipeline going through the Black Sea into northern Turkey and then to Istanbul, which will supply the European Union. And so there, there are uh, many, uh, there's a few uh, issues of disagreement where there are many uh, possibilities for cooperation between these two countries. What that means specifically for the United States or what that specifically means for uh, the region as a whole is, is really unknown 
at this point. Do you think that this is a foreshadowing of perhaps losing Turkey as part of the, uh, the European Union? Uh, do you think that that could be a potential fallout at some I mean, point? It's, I, along, with, along with certainly the... Um, I think that the European Union would, would welcome any, any possibility for Turkey's um, prosperity in Turkey's ability to right the ship. Um, unfortunately, more so than not, it, it, it's been the reaction by the Erdogan government of the latest coup d'etat in um, detaining tens of thousands of people, purging the country of, of political enemies, um, that has really uh, put a uh, put a wrench in the in in that process. It sort of gives off a smell of something like North Korea, I think, uh, the sort of same sort of fragrant uh, of what we've we've, be, we've been seeing in North Korea lately. Um, yeah, it's, it's constant and purging. What's, what's amazing is that Turkey, over the last ten years, have, has had the worst record of of press and media rights in the entire world, um, and this is a country that considers itself a, a pluralist democracy, um, yeah, considers yeah. itself, of course, um, even more so than North Korea when it comes to uh, 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 clamping down on press and media freedoms. Because, well, yeah. journalists don't really go to, to North Korea too often. <laughs> yeah. but they, Things but don't they, generally work out very well. But exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But they go to Turkey. Yes. And they find themselves many times in prison, yes. beaten, fined, uh, or fired. Well, Russell, I want to thank you for being on the show today. Um, it was very interesting doing this over Skype. I hope uh, next time you make it to Hawaii, we can actually do a live interview and bring you into the studio. But uh, I want to thank you for, for coming on Think Tech Hawaii and, and being my guest on the show today. I think uh, it's, a, it's an area of the world that deserves observation. And again, thank you. Thank you, Chris. It's great to be here. Okay. Aloha. Aloha. And everyone, I want to say aloha to you, and uh, hopefully we'll see you again right here back on Think Tech Hawaii in two weeks with The Economy News. Thank you.